Welcome back to Van's Reading. We're on Beyond Order by Jordan Peterson. We're on rule three. All right. Do not hide unwanted things in the fog. Those damned plates. I love my father-in-law. I respect him too. He is extremely stable emotionally. One of those tough or fortunate people, perhaps a little of both, who can let the trials and tribulations of life roll off him and keep moving forward with a little complaint and plenty of competence. He is an old guy now, Dal Roberts, 88. He has had a knee replaced and is planning to get the remaining one done. He has had stents inserted in the coronary arteries and a heart valve replaced. He suffers from drop foot and sometimes slips and falls because of it. But he was still curling a year ago, pushing the heavy granite rock down the ice with a stick specifically designed for people who can no longer crouch down crouched down as easily as they once could. When his wife, Beth, now deceased, developed dementia at a relatively young age, he took care of her in, in as uncomplaining and unresentful a manner as anyone could imagine. That's such a weird sentence. When his wife, Beth, now deceased, developed dementia at a re relatively young age, he took care of her in as uncomplaining and unresentful a manner as anyone could imagine. It was impressive. I am by no means convinced that I could have fared as well. He cared for her. Right to the point where it became impossible for him to lift her out of whatever chair she had settled into. This was long after she had lost the ability to speak, but it was obvious by the way her eyes lit up when he entered the room that she still loved him. And the feeling was mutual. I would not describe him as someone who is prone to avoidance when the going gets tough. Quite the contrary. When Dal was a much younger man, he was for several decades a real estate dealer in Fairview, Alberta. The small town where I grew up, we lived right across the street from the Roberts family. In fact, during that time, he habitually went home for lunch in accordance with the general custom. Beth, Beth typically prepared him soup, probably, uh, probably Campbell's, which everyone ate at the time. Mm -mm -mm, good. And a sandwich. One day, without warning, he snapped at his wife. Why in the world? Why in the world do we always eat off these tiny plates? I hate eating off these tiny, tiny plates. She had been serving the sandwiches on bread and butter plates, which <laughs> average about six or seven inches in diameter, instead of a full-size dinner plate of ten to twelve inches. My God, he remembers the inches. Uh, she related the story to her daughter soon after in a state of mild shock. The story has been retold too much laughter at family gatherings many times since uh, many times since. After all, she had been serving him lunch on those plates for at least 20 years by the time he finally said anything. She had no idea that he was annoyed by her table settings. He had never objected, and there is something inexhaustibly amusing about that. Now it is possible that he was ir irritated by something else to altogether that, that day and did not really care about the plates. And in one sense, it is a trivial issue, but seen another way, it is not trivial at all for two reasons. First, if something happens every day, it is important and lunch was happening every day. In consequence, if there was something about it that was chronically bothersome, even in a minor sort of way, it needed to be attended to. Uh, it needed to be attended to. Second, it is very common to allow so-called minor irritations, which are not minor, as I said, if they happen constantly, to continue for years without comment or resolution. Here is the problem. Collect a hundred or a thousand of those and your life is miserable <laughs> and your marriage doomed. Do not pretend you are happy with something if you're not. And if a reasonable solution might, uh, uh, might in principle, be negotiated. Have the damn fight. Unpleasant as that might be in the moment, it is one less straw on the camel's back. And that is particularly true for those daily events that everyone is prone to regard as trivial. Even the plates on which you eat your lunch. Life is what repeats and it is worth getting what repeats right. Yo, that is so true. <laughs> that is deep and true. Oh God, that is beautiful, man. Have the damn fight, bitches. Eat it. That's such a Jordan Peterson lie. Just not worth the fight. Here is a more serious story of the same type. I had a client who had come to see me about her plans to move to private practice after many years as an accountant with a large corporation. She was well-respected in her profession and was a competent, kind, and careful person. 
but she was also very unhappy. Sorry, I'm laughing, but it's a deep story. I presumed initially that her unhappiness stemmed from anxiety about her career transition, but she managed that but she managed that move without a hitch during the time we continued our sessions. While other issues rose to the forefront, her problem was not her career change. It was her marriage. She described her husband as extraordinarily self-centered and simultaneously overly concerned with how he appeared in the eyes of others. It was a contradictory combination in some manner. Although it is common enough to see this touching of opposites in a personality, if you lean too far in one direction, something else in you leans equally far in the other. So despite the husband's narcissism, at least from his wife, from his wife's perspective, he was enthralled to the opinions of everyone he met, excepting the members of his own family. He also drank too much, a habit which exaggerated his temperamental defects. My client was not comfortable in her own home. She did not feel there was anything truly of her within the apartment she shared with her husband. The couple had no children. Her situation provided a good example of how, of how what is outside can profoundly reflect what is inside. Which is why I suggest people who are in a psychological trouble that might begin their recovery by cleaning up and then beautifying, if possible, their rooms or their household's furnishing, which she described as showy, ornate and uncomfortable, have been chosen by her husband. Furthermore, he avidly collected 1960s and 70s pop art and the walls of the house were crowded with these items, which he had spent time seeking out in, in galleries and otherwise gathering for many years often while she sat waiting outside in the car. She told me that she did not care about the furnishings and the excess of decorative, of, of decorative objects. But that was not really true. What was true was she did not care for them. Not a bit. Neither the show, showiness nor the furnishing nor the plethora of artworks that made up her husband's collection appealed her to taste. Appealed to her taste. Uh, she tended toward a minimalist aesthetic, or perhaps the preference was a consequence of, of her husband's decorate, decorative excesses. It was never quite clear what she might have preferred. Uh, I lost my place, apologies. It was never quite clear what she might have preferred, and perhaps that was part of the problem, because she did not know what she liked and was equally vague about her dislikes. She was not in the strongest position to put forward her own opinions. It is difficult to win an argument or even begin one if you have not carefully articulated what you want or do not and need or do not. However, she certainly did not enjoy feeling like a stranger in her own home. For that reason, she never had friends over to visit, which was also a non-trivial problem, contributing as it did to her feelings of isolation. Sorry, I'm not, I'm thinking of funny things and I just laugh. But the furnishings and paintings continued to accrue one shopping expedition at a time. In Canada and abroad and with each purchase, there was, a, there was less of her in the house and in the marriage, and increasingly more of her husband. Nonetheless, my client never, want, never went to war. She never had a fit of anger. She never put her fist through a particularly objection, objectionable canvas hanging on the living room wall. In all the decades of her married life, she never had an outburst of genuine rage. She never directly conclusively confronted the fact that she, had, that she hated her home and her subordination to her husband's taste. Instead, she let him have his way, repeatedly increment by increment, because she claimed that such trivialities were not worth fighting for. And with each defeat, the next disagreement became more necessary, although less likely, because she understood that a serious discussion once initiated risk expanding to include all the things that were troublesome about her marriage and that a real no holds bar battle would def would, would would therefore therefore would therefore likely ensue then everything wrong might spell out and have to be faced and dealt with by one means or another so she kept silent but she was chronically repressed and constantly resentful and felt that she had wasted much of the opportunity of her life it is a mistake to, to consider the furnishing and the pop art paintings as simple material objects. They were more truly and importantly containers of information, so to speak, about the state of the marriage and were certainly experienced as such by my client. Every single object of art was the concrete realization of a victory. Whoa, that's psychotic. 
Uh, Ferric, though it may have been, and, and a defeat, or at least a negotiation that did not that did not occur and therefore a fight that was over before it started and there were dozens or perhaps hundreds of these each a weapon in unspoken destructive and decades long war unsurprisingly given the circumstances the couple split up after 30 years of marriage i believe the husband retained all the furniture and art of course here is a thought a terrifying and dispiriting thought to motivate improvement in your marriage, to scare you into the appalling difficulties of true negotiation. Every little problem you have every morning, afternoon or evening with your spouse will be repeated for each of the 15,000 days that will make up a 40 year marriage. Every trivial but chronic disagreement about cooking, dishes, house cleaning, responsibility for finances or frequency of intimate contact will be duplicated over and over unless you successfully address it. Perhaps you think moment to moment at least that it is best to avoid confrontation and drift along in apparent but false peace. Make no mistake about it. However, you age as you drift just as rapidly as you age as you strive, but you have no direction when you drift and the probability that you will obtain what you need and want by drifting aimlessly is very low. Things fall apart, uh, of, sorry, things fall apart, fall apart, Fall apart of their own accord, but the sins of men speed their deteri deteri oh God, their deterioration, 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 deterioration. That is wisdom from the ages. It may well be that con conscious apprehension of the horror of the same small hell forever repeated is precisely what is necessary to force you to confront the problems in your marriage and negotiate in good, desperate faith to solve them. However. It is the easiest of matters, particularly in the short term, to ignore the prick of conscience and let the small defeat slide day after day. This is not a good strategy. Only careful aim and wakeful striving and commitment can eliminate the oft incremental calamity of willful blindness, stem the entropic tide and keep catastrophe familial and social alike at bay. Corruption, commission and omission. Corruption of the form we are discussing is, in my opinion, integrally linked to deception, to lying more bluntly and more important to self-deception. Now, strict log log uh, logicians uh, regard self-deception as an impossibility. They cannot understand how it is impossible. Uh, sorry, they cannot understand how it is possible for a person to believe one thing and its opposite simultaneously. Logicians are not psychologists, however. And they obviously do not notice or else fail to take into account the fact that they themselves have family members, for example, for whom they at least occasionally feel loved and hate at the same time. Furthermore, it is not obvious what believe uh, means when discussing human belief, nor what is meant by simultaneously. I can believe one thing today and another tomorrow and very often get away with it, at least in the short term, uh, at least in the short term, sorry. <laughs> And on many occasions, I have experienced what was very nearly simultaneous belief in one thing and its opposite while reading undergraduate university papers in which the writer made a claim in one paragraph and completely contradictory claim in the next. Sometimes that happened within the span of a single sentence. There are many conditions or circumstances, uh, circumstances under which self-deception can theoretically occur. Psychoanalysts have explored many of these with Freud leading the way. Freud believed that much of mental illness was due to repression, which is arguably and reasonably considered a form of self-deception. For him, memories of traumatically troubling events were unconsciously banished to perdition in the unconscious, where they rattled around and caused trouble, like poltergeist in a dungeon. Freud understood that the human personality was not unitary. Instead, it consists of loose, fragmented cacophony of spirits who did not always agree or even communicate the truth the truth of this claim is self-evident at least in one simple manner we think about we can think about things we can simulate potential or alternative actions or events without immediately having to act them out this association of thought and action is necessary for abstract thought even to exist thus we can clearly think or say one thing and do another this is fine when merely thinking prior to acting, but perhaps not so good when we promise or claim to believe something and then act in a manner indicating that we truly have faith in something else. 
This is a form of deception, a disjunction in character, a contradiction between modes of being. It has even been named to claim one belief and then to act or speak in a different or even opposite manner constitutes a performative contradiction, according to certain modern philosophers, an implicit lie, an implicit lie in my opinion. The holding of contradictory beliefs also becomes a problem when the holder attempts to act out both simultaneously and discovers, often to his or her great chagrin, the paradox that makes such an attempt impossible. Freud catalogued an extensive list of phenomena akin to repression, the active rejection of potentially conscious psychological material from awareness, which he termed defense mechanisms. Huh. These include denial. The truth is not so bad reaction. Sorry, this is this includes denial. The truth is not so bad reaction formation. I really, really, really love my mother. Displacement. The boss yells at me. I yell at my wife. My wife yells at the baby. The bob, the baby bites the cat. Uh, identification. I am bullied, so I am motivated to be a bully. Rationalization. A self-serving explanation for a low-quality action. Intellectualization. A favorite of the early funny neuro neuro uh, neurotic Woody Allen. So a favorite of the early funny neurotic Woody Allen. Sublimation. I can always paint nude women and projection. I'm not touchy. You're just annoying. Huh. Freud was an outstanding philosopher of deceit. He was not afraid to point out the relationship between dishonesty and psychopathology. Nonetheless, his ideas of self-deception suffer, in my opinion, from two major errors. First error. Freud failed to notice that sins of omission contributed to mental il illness as much as or more than the sins of commission. Listed above the constitute repression. In doing so, he merely thought in the typical manner. People generally believe that actively doing something bad, that is in the sin of commission, is on average worse than passively not doing something good, that is in the sin of omission. Perhaps... This is because there are always good things we're not doing. Some sins of omission are therefore inevitable. In any case, there are still times when willful blindness nonetheless produce more serious catastrophes, more easily rationalized away than the active or the unconscious repression of something terrible, but understood the latter being a sin of commission because it is knowing. The former problem, willful blindness occurs when you could come to know something but cease exploring so that you fail to discover something that might cause you substantial discomfort. Spin doctors call this self-imposed ignorance plausible deniability, which is a phrase that indicates in inten oh this is good, which is a phrase that indicates intellectualized rationalized rationalization of the most pathological order. It should be noted that such blindness is often regarded as an outright crime. If you're a CEO, for example, and you suspect that your treasurer is cooking the books and you do not investigate because you do not want to know, you may still be liable for your inaction, as, an, as is appropriate. Failing to look under the bed when you strongly suspect a monster is lurking there is not an advisable strategy. Second error. Freud assumed that things experienced are things understood. In accordance with that assumption, he believed that a memory trace existed somewhere in the mind that accurately represented the past, like an objective video recording. These would be reasonable presumptions of our experience while simply a series objectively real and self-evident. Evidence transmitted through our senses, thought about, about, evaluated, and then acted upon. If this was all true... A traumatic experience would be accurately rep represented in, in memory, even when pushed out of awareness by unconscious mechanisms or conscious. But Freud presumed that the former because of its understood but terrible nature. However, neither reality nor our processing of reality is as objective or articulated as Freud presupposed. Okay, so that's an interesting thing where I think what... what, uh, what Peterson saying is that when we do have traumatic experiences, we can't understand them. His his assumption, his belief is that we don't understand certain traumatic experiences, and I think he's right because that's why we have psychologists in today's world. They wouldn't they wouldn't exist if it wasn't for that. So basically, what he's saying is that we don't have enough information to understand the traumatic experience. So we understand that something traumatic emotionally happened to us, and therefore. Uh, 
we don't have enough information to understand it, and therefore uh, we keep on having these uh, kind of like defense mechanisms uh, and uh, ignorance, or yeah, basically defense mechanisms like ignorance and uh, creating, um, you know, uh, scenarios where you become, where you defeat that uh, that uh, traumatic experience over and over again. So you have this def defense mechanism, which is interesting. Uh, but what's more interesting is that I don't know why. Maybe Freud, from his perspective, because he learned it later on, obviously could he understand it. Maybe that's the case: is that you could learn to figure out what that traumatic experience and understand it, and then it becomes less traumatic because you understand understood why it happened to you. And then, yeah. So, yeah, I will add my points later after this when I finish the chapter. I mean, I mean the part of the rule actually. Imagine, for example, that you have, have been ignored romantically more than you can tolerate for several months by your wife or husband. Then you encounter him or her leaning over the fence, talking in a friendly manner, and perhaps no more than that to an, attra to an attractive neighbor. How we, how we process such anomalous, novel, troublesome, or even traumatic experiences is very rarely a matter of perception, followed by conscious understanding and thought, then emotion or motivation derived from that thought, then action. What happens instead is akin to what we discussed at length in Rule 1 and Rule 2. We process the unknown world from the bottom up. We encounter containers of information, so to speak, whose full import is by no means self-evident. Upon witnessing your spouse talking to the neighbor, therefore, it is not as if you think. In an altogether articulated and fully developed philosophical form, I have been lonesome and deprived physically for months, and, uh, for months by my spouse. Although I have not said anything in detail, this has caused me constant frustration and pain. Now he or she is rubbing it in, rubbing it in as far as I am concerned by being so outgoing with a comparative stranger when I have experienced so little attention. It is much more likely that anger, grief and loneliness have accumulated with you with each rejection, bit by bit until you are filled to the brim and now overflowing. The sudden appearance of negative emotion does not necessarily mean that you are even now fully conscious of its accu accumulation. Accumulation. You many well, as in the case of my father-in-law or my client, have experienced the frustration build up gradually enough so that you found yourself more irritable and unhappy, but that does not necessarily mean that you notice the cause. And what is the cause? The range possibility uh, the range of possibilities is uncomfortably broad. Perhaps you're not being ignored at all. Perhaps you're not being ignored at all. Instead, you have been having trouble at work and that has produced a decrease in your overall confidence. <clears throat> yeah. In consequence, you have been become sensitized to any signs of rejection, even imaginary with your marriage. So what you must determine is not so much why your wife or husband is no longer attentive attentive to you but what is about your boss colleagues or career that is destabilizing you that puts the true cause of your discomfort a long distance away from the symptoms the feelings of rejection that are making you irritable sensitive and hurt there is nothing obvious about the relationship between cause and effect in such cases perhaps you really are being ignored just as you sus suspect Perhaps it is a sign of an impending affair and a manifestation of the trajectory trajectory that leads to divorce. Both of those, if true, are serious problems. It is no wonder you are upset, but you may remain stubbornly unwilling to consider that your career or marriage is in trouble. And that is no surprise, but it is not helpful. On top of all that is the general complexity of life complicating the search for clarity. Consider the question, what really happened? Say in a failed marriage, divorce, and a child custody battle, the answer no that query is so complex that settling the disagreements frequently requires court evaluation and multi-party assessment. Even then, one or even both of the protagonists is unlikely to believe that the truth has been served. This is partly because events in general and interpersonal events specifically do not exist as simple, objective facts independent of one another. Everything depends for its meaning for the information it truly represents, on the context in which it is embedded, much of which is not available for perception or consideration when the event in question occurs. The meaning of what someone's wife says to him today is dependent on everything both 
have ever said to each other, everything they have ever done together, and the contents of their mutual imaginations. And that does not exhaust the complexity. Such meaning may have may even be importantly dependent on how far, example, the wife's mother treated her father or her grandmother treated her grandfather, as well as the relationship between men and women in their broader culture. This is why domestic arguments so often spiral out of control, particularly when a pattern continual and effective communication has never been established. One thing leads to a deeper thing, and that leads deeper yet until an argument that started over what size plates are the best used at lunchtime turns into a no holds bar war about whether the marriage in question would be better would be better dissolved. dissolved. And there is certainly fear of falling down a hole of that size, again, particularly when much has remained unspoken. That motivates the proclivity to keep things to yourself when they would be better but dangerously said. Okay, so that's an interesting thing. Okay, I like this chapter. Um, it's the first part is done. There's only a second part later on. It's super interesting from his perspective, which I like. Is that okay? So you're living some with someone, family member, maybe a wife, etc. You know, you shouldn't be keeping things in the dark. You should fight it out, which I like. That's a good idea. You know, my parents. Oh, we're fighting every day, and you know, it should be fought about because. You need to uh, bring out what is, you know, important to the team, to the marriage, etc. And so it does make sense. Uh, I like that, you know, you have to point out what's, you know, what what's underneath so that the marriage can flourish. If, you know, it sucks. You can't really tell because I guess it has to do with luck or, you know, by choosing wisely, if you think you can choose wisely. So... It's an interesting thing because he's saying, okay, if you want to have a good marriage, then you have to be honest with each other and you have to be, you know, realistic with each other emotionally, understand where each person is every day and, you know, fight it out no matter what. But don't go beyond or, you know, beyond the, the threshold of physical physicality. Just, I think you need to be honest with each other, understand each other where you are emotionally. But here's the question, right? So like, yeah, you can fight it out, but oh, you know what? He's kind of right. You have to fight it out because you have to determine some. It doesn't mean you're going to always win, right? But like he said in the first rule, you know, or the second, I can't remember, is that you have to allow the other person to play. So if you keep on playing, right, that means, uh, what does it mean? It means that that person will stay because you let them win. And because if they feel they can win again, then they'll stay. If they keep on losing, 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 right? Like he says with the... The woman uh, who kept on letting her husband decide what's in the apartment, they were like trophies, which is psychotic. Uh, <laughs> uh, basically, what's interesting about that is that there needs to be, you know, a, com a, a conversation every day, uh, speaking to each other emotionally, understanding where you guys are at. Maybe not every day, but maybe every second day and go out and do everything, you know, do certain things as a team. And... You know, understanding, okay, why is he like this? Why like that? And then actually fight out certain things that they don't like because someone is trying to win something because they like it or prefer it that way. And so they have to fight each other in order to decide what is the right way of living or, or the routine that they want to live in. So like you said, so you play, figure out who's, you know, who's right or who's wrong, or in this case, who wins or lose. And then what else? Um... Uh, when to lose and keep the conversation keep and the, do it every day until you know hopefully healthily and happily but then there's also other aspects of it where it's very difficult to keep you know the, the, what you keep on hearing is attraction goes down love goes down you become a different person a mother you know a woman becomes a mother cares more for the children and therefore it's a different type of interaction you know, certain things change, the dynamic changes, less sex in the preg you know, when they're pregnant, etc. Certain things change, which is interesting. Um, but yeah, it does, it's very, that's pretty cool. Then the second thing is where I liked, he talked about was the Freud thing where he brought up certain defense mechanisms and why people, you know, bully or, uh, you know, the, the, the denial, the denial, the truth is not so bad, reaction formation. Uh, reaction formation really really love my mother 
displacement the boss yells at me i yell at my wife my wife yells at my baby the baby buys the so it's very super interesting like and then there's like the identification i'm bullied so i'm motivated to be a bully rationalization a self-serving explanation for low quality action okay and then intellectualization a favorite of the early funny neurotic woody adams i don't get that one that one's an interesting uh view on that it doesn't really make sense uh it does that one i'm not sure about that one is a little bit nonsensical to me when he said that a favorite of the early funny neurotic woody allen so intake or maybe being too smart for your own good maybe that could be the case hmm. uh, I, maybe sublimation i can always paint a new woman and projection i'm not touchy you're just annoying um yeah i met people like that who project um <laughs> there's a lot of them but that's the interesting thing. Okay, so that's pretty cool. The Freud thing was cool. I like that idea that a lot of people have defense mechanisms. They all do. I know quite a few have really hardcore defense mechanisms, like physical defense mechanism, where they have like a twitch or a, you know itch of some kind. So, I mean, that makes sense to me. And like, not only it's psychological, maybe they have a certain way of doing things when they get the defense mechanism. Uh, what else was there? He said about... This is why domestic men so often spiral out of control, particularly when a pattern has never been established. One thing leads to a deeper thing and the lead needs deeper. Yeah. Okay, so he's saying that if things are not out, it gets deeper and deeper and deeper and deeper and deeper. So that's an interesting question. And the other thing is like, how would you decide on a partner if, you, if they have, you know, certain secrets? Does that secrets come out? Have you done mistakes in your past life? Uh, maybe they've done mistakes in the past. Like, how does that get resolved? That do, do, do they reach a agreement? Do they understand that they're human? I mean, that's a difficult one, right? It's it's tough to decide. Like, what? Like, my view of it: if you're just human and maybe decide to live in a different way than your past, and because you realize the mistakes that you live in. You should be, you know, going for that one direction and trying to find the best possible life for yourself in, in the sense of what is it spiritually, emotionally, you know, physically uh, and mentally altogether is, you know, the best way I would approach that because that's what we all, I think, want. I think a lot of people tend to chase, I mean, like we tend to chase money quite a f I mean, I tend, tend to chase money quite a bit, but... I think that's because I wanted more of a resource and make it, you know, available for everybody. But I think, you know, we have to ask ourselves, why do we have these psychological defense mechanisms? It's more there to make us survive. It's a brain thing, right? But maybe there can be, you know, things can be taught wrong to us. Some things can be taught wrong to us. And so we get, you know, we do the wrong thing. Like he says, like rationality, like in the beginning, talking about rationality where you do something bad it's like i did this because of that i did this because of this i did you know it's an interesting idea of that which i really liked um uh yeah so i like that i like that a lot i like this part of the rule um yeah so that's it for the part one of rule three and it was pretty good i really liked it okay uh you know what to do comment like subscribe you know the, the whole shebang um Super interesting part of the rule three. Um, I'm going to continue in the next video. And then, yeah, that will be the rule three. So that will be three. Okay, goodbye. <laughs> Cheers.